everybody. It's Michael Shermer. It's time for another episode of The Michael Shermer Show. I am the publisher on my day job of this magazine, Skeptic, which you can pick up at any bookstore in uh, North America or even some of the colonies <laughs> for our guest today. And um, we, uh, or you can go to skeptic.com and just click on magazine. And you can order it there. Of course, it's all digital. Our issues this year are Trans Matters, Abortion Matters, Race Matters, which comes out in September, and then Nationalism Matters. Uh, so the idea here is we are branching out a little bit of our skepticism to uh, dealing with other controversies besides UFOs and psychics and that sort of thing. <clears throat> and uh, the artwork behind me, I'm displaying on the podcast now some of the original artwork from Pat Lindsay, my late partner who died a year ago. And just to feature in the old days, back in the 90s, when artists actually did paintings for uh, magazine covers. So that's kind of cool. Anyway, my guest today is Constantin Kissin, a journalist, comedian, voiceover actor, and social commentator born in the Soviet Union, where he experienced both untold wealth and grinding poverty. He moved to the UK when he was 13 years old. Now an award-winning performer, he co-presents the popular YouTube series Trigger Trigonometry, which I love, alongside Francis Foster. Together, they've interviewed some of the most in-demand intellectuals of our age, such as Douglas Murray, Jordan Peterson, and many others. Here's the new book, a Immigrants and Immigrants Love Letter to the West. I read it on audio, as usual, and then I got the hard copy I reread this morning, Constantin. It was a great read, big fun. Uh, give us a little bit of background. Your opening chapters are on, on uh, your own particular unique history. I'll just open here with... Uh, your page one here. Trust me, the West is West is best. Here's what you write, <clears throat> non-controversially. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm still have a little bit of COVID voice here. Um, black people in contemporary America often refer to the talk, a conversation in which they advise their children how to act if they're stopped by the police. I remember my parents giving me an equivalent lecture when I was seven years old and living in the Soviet Union. Except, instead of learning how to placate trigger-happy cops, we were instructed how to keep our private conversations secret from the state. That is pretty unusual uh, uh, for here in the West. So let's start there. Give us a little bit of background of how you came out of that environment. Well, Michael, I suppose the most remarkable thing about that story is that I was growing up at the very, very, very tail end of the Soviet Union, by which... Most of the repression and the restriction and the censorship and the, the gulags and everything was long since over. And even at the very tail end of that society, uh, my parents were quite rightly, uh, you know, worried that things that we were discussing in the family home, which they were discussing in the family home, criticism of the Soviet regime or communism or socialism or uh, the observation that, you know, maybe the shops are empty or whatever. These all of these things. Uh, were considered uh, difficult to talk about and frankly not to be discussed outside the home because if you as a kid were to, to go to school and reveal some of this, uh, you would be in big trouble and more importantly, your parents would be, be in big trouble. And uh, our own family history of this uh, was full of uh, stories like this. So for example, my grandfather, again, very late in the Soviet Union, I talk about this in a book, as you know, towards uh, the mid 80s, I think it would have been, uh, he criticized the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan uh, and was, uh, you know, when he didn't even do it in public, he did it in a private conversation, private discussion. A supposed friend reported him to the KGB. They searched this, raided his house the next day. He was fired from his job. His wife was fired from her job and their children. That's my dad and, and his younger sister, both kicked out of university with all sorts of consequences. The friends ostracized them, many of them. Uh, and so on and so forth. So they were kind of cancelled before it was the cool thing to, to, to do. Um, and there are many, many things like this in, in my own family. And of course, lots of people around us could tell you similar stories. So I grew up in an environment where there was a lot of censorship. There was a lot of self-censorship. People worry about speaking their mind in public or even in private. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to write the book, because I'm trying to uh, warn people in the West that these new and cool, shiny things that we're all uh, getting involved with uh, are actually quite old, very, very tried and tested, and don't lead us anywhere good. 
Right. There's this idea of the difference between private and public thoughts. You have that great um, that thought experiment in your book of, from Bill Burr uh, about if the New York Times printed on their front page all of your private thoughts from the night before. You know, would, would anybody survive that? <laughs> well, exactly. And so uh, I think we've forgotten uh, that human beings are flawed. This is why one of the things we were, Francis and I, uh, were just on, on Joe Rogan's show a few weeks ago. And this is one of the things that we talked about. Uh, part of, you know, I'm a big fan of uh, Thomas Sowell and some of his writing. And this is one of the things he talks about in a book called The Conflict of Visions, uh, in which he talks about uh, the difference between two visions. One of them is what he calls the constrained vision. And that is the idea that human beings are flawed, imperfect, they'll make mistakes and, and so on and so forth. And so the best way to predict what they're likely to do in the future is to look around at history and, and how they're behaving now. And the other vision is, of course, the progressive vision, which says that human beings must be perfected. We must make a new man, as we did in the Soviet Union, Homo Sovieticus. Uh, and uh, we must pursue by all means this idea that human beings will be perfected. And so we've lent, uh, it will lean rather in very heavily in the West, I think, particularly in the Anglosphere, into this idea of the perfectibility of man woman and all the other genders uh, and so we are kind of at a point where we we expect each other to be perfect and the idea that you know downloading your private thoughts and publishing them on the front page of a newspaper would end your career is something every single human being in the history of humanity could easily relate to and yet somehow we seem to have forgotten it yeah i love soul's uh, work and that particular analogy uh, steve pinker ran with in his book the blank slate showing mm. uh you know why it's not true it's not it's not enough just to say well that's a ridiculous idea why is it not true and as he points out um that the original eugenics movement in the west was supported by uh liberals progressives people who wanted to use genetic engineering to uh achieve this goal of, of perfecting hum human nature and of course that that's a you know that's that's kind of the opposite of what it is now. Uh, eugenics is often associated with the right wing after the Nazis. But before that, all the leading liberal intellectuals or progressive intellectuals supported it in, in that vein of, you know, if we can re-engineer society politically and economically, why can't we do it biologically? Well, that's exactly right. And uh, by the way, I, I'd appreciate that uh, Pinker uh, added that. Why is it not true? But uh, I, th I guess Thomas Sowell, who was big on facts, who is big on facts and, and all of that. Yeah, I think he, what he would say is uh, actually uh, the best way to understand that human beings are flawed is to embrace the fact that if you look historically and if you look at how we behave in the present, we behave in ways that tell us that we are flawed. Uh, and so it's the observation of the past reality in addition to the points that uh, Pinker makes in that book that I think are, are really a telltale sign that this perfectibility is uh, is constrained. It's, it's not forever. There's certain things that we'll never be able to eradicate. And that's why, I, you know, I'm sure you, uh, like me, love comedy because that is what comedy often seeks to expose, the fact that we are not perfect, that the fact that we don't think in ways that we'd necessarily be proud of even if, if we were to speak our thoughts out loud. And very often the, the bits of material that land the hardest are when the comedian speaks about how they actually think in a way that you're not supposed to think. Um, so th <laughs> yeah. th that's, that's always been the interesting thing about comedy, right? Or like the definition of a political gaffe is when a politician accidentally says something that's true and then has right. to walk it back. <laughs> <laughs> it's well, like, exactly. I know it's true, and you know it's true, and I know that you know that it's true, and I know that you know that I know, that, and so on. But we all have to keep our mouths shut, you know, the emperor's new clothes and all that. Yeah, Pinker also points out all that grim architecture in the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc, and particularly like East Germany and so on. I mean, you could just see it at the border looking left or right uh, in Berlin. It's just the difference in the architecture was based on this premise of your view of human nature which is that, you know, people don't care about gardens and nature and, you know, you can just lay it out like plumbing in, in straight lines and blocks of apartments and people will be perfectly happy. You know, not so. Mm. Uh, you know what? I, I don't know how, how true that is. Uh, growing up in the Soviet Union myself, I would say that actually, uh, you know, the, the ability to build a country essentially from scratch and to, to decide as a government exactly what you're going to do did allow 
uh, to build very beautiful cities in many ways, Moscow and Kiev, uh, in terms of the parks and the big, what we call uh, alleys in Russian alley. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're very beautiful uh, squares as well. Uh, I suspect this is a narrative that people in the West like because it fits what they already think about the Soviets. I think the main reason that the Soviet buildings were crappy, gray, uh, you know, apartment blocks, etc., is because they're cheaper to, to, to build than housing people in, uh, you know, semi-detached or detached houses. I think that's a much more likely explanation uh, yeah, <laughs> of, actually, of why that point. happened. Hmm. Yeah, I think I'll withdraw that because actually I've been to Moscow twice and I've been through many of those parks just out early morning in the, on, on a run or whatever, and they're gorgeous. Yeah, back in the day when you could go there. That's too bad. found another quote I used um, from Dostoevsky. Um, Every man has reminiscences which he would not tell to anyone but, his, but only his friends. He has other matters in his mind which he would not reveal even to his friends, but only to himself, and that in secret. But there are other things which a man is afraid to tell even to himself, and every decent man has a number of such things stored away in his mind. That reminded me of some of the stuff you were writing about in your book, you know, that free speech is, is super important. I, I agree with everything you said about uh, free speech in your book. But to what extent do we self-censor, right? Because I really don't want to tell people what I'm really thinking. As it, It's not that that makes me a racist or a misogynist or a anti-Semite or whatever. It's just that people have private thoughts. And, you know, it, what matters is, are they expressed? Do you actually act on them? And so on. Yeah. Well, as you know, in the book, I don't argue for compelled speech. I don't, I'm not arguing that you should <laughs> right. reveal all your deepest intimate secrets to every stranger <laughs> because that is the free speech society in which I believe. I just believe that you should have the ability uh, to say what you think without losing your job or without losing your column or without being, uh, you know, otherwise punished by the government or by the legal system or by your employer, by whoever. For expressing opinions, even even if the, I may not necessarily agree or like them, I think that's the basic standard of a free society. And I make the point in the book, Michael, as you know, that I don't just consider this to be like an important principle that all right-thinking people should get behind. I draw a direct link between that and the freedom, the scientific progress, the technological progress, and the dominance, frankly, of the Anglosphere countries in the world and their ability to project their power and to secure for themselves uh, the greatest share of resources and therefore to make sure that their citizens are prosperous and healthy and safe and live stable and, and, and comfortable lives. Uh, there's a direct connection between these things uh, and the ability to express your thoughts freely, the ability to pursue uh, your business freely to to create you know like in, in in we talk about how china has become this capitalist place well not really because quite a lot of it is controlled by government apparatchiks so whether you make a business decision this way or that way depends on government decisions and it's that freedom to think for yourself to speak for yourself to decide for yourself how you're going to run your business that is one of the key elements of why the west has been as successful as it is and as you know the prediction I make is that if we throw that away, then we throw away the prosperity and the comfort and the safety and the stability that comes with it. Yeah, let's let's uh, define the West. What do you mean by the West? Well, this is one of the best criticisms that people have made of the book that I actually agree with very much because an immigrant's love letter to the West is a marketing, I think, very good title for a book. What I'm actually talking about is, and it doesn't sound quite as catchy, is an immigrant's love letter to the Anglosphere. Uh, because, mm. as you know, and uh, the history of the 20th and the 19th century shows, Germany, France, these are countries which have very different attitudes to many of the same things. Uh, you know, th some of the the products of the French Revolution, for example, are this obsession with rationality over anything else, uh, which I'm not particularly comfortable with. You know, I am someone who does think the constrained vision is one that ought to be included in the conversation. Uh, and the idea that we can rationalize ourselves in, into a brave new world uh, is one that seems to me to be empirically false. Um, and so the French conception of that way of doing things to me, I find, uh, you know, imperfect. Uh, Germany has its own checkered history uh, in recent uh, centuries with, with some of the ideas that they've implemented. And so uh, it, it seems to me that the Anglosphere, the descendants of the British Empire, 
which is, you know, Britain, America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, to some extent, you know, India is obviously a very different country with, with a very rich history of its culture of its own. But the countries that were part of the British Empire that, that remain English speaking, they've inherited some very important traditions, it seems to me. Uh, and it is those countries that are, in my, you know, humble opinion, the best countries to be in in the world. It's the countries uh, that are the best countries, not only in my opinion, but, it, you know, there seems to be several billion potential immigrants who would quite like to live in one of those countries, too. And that seems to be one of the best tests for how well a society is doing comparatively to others. Do people want to live there? Do people want to move there? Well, on the facts of it, it seems that they do. And so uh, those are the countries to, to whom the love letter is. And, I, I, and those are the countries in which I hope my children have the opportunity to grow up. And I, you know, the reason I wrote the book and the reason I do what I do on a day to day basis is I would like those countries to remain uh, as safe, comfortable, prosperous and so on as they have been uh, in my lifetime. Yeah, I think I should point out that how quickly these uh, things can change. Germany, post World War II, has become quite a different country than it was before that. My, my wife's from Cologne, Germany, and she tells me that you know when she was growing up in school, they just had it pounded into them: these are the sins of our past, and we are never, ever, ever going to do this again. We have changed. This is our new, you know, standards and norms, and and uh, all the way to the point where Angela Merkel famously opened the borders, almost like. We're so guilty of treating, uh, you know, immigrants and, and minorities in our country badly. We're just going to let them all in. Of course, that kind of backfired, right? So there, um, you know, so that kind of brings up the subject of, uh, you know, immigration, which you have a whole chapter on in your book. You know, to what extent do you, you know, open the borders up, close them up? You know, what's the percentage? And to what extent do you want people who already largely agree with your view of human nature, let's say, or your values about things like free speech and, and, and democracy and so on, versus letting people in that don't share those, and then they're going to try to change your country's norms. Mm. Well, my view on that, Michael, first and foremost, is that that is, is, a, is a question should be decided democratically. People should vote for the type of immigration that they want, and that is the type of immigration that the government should allow and implement. And both in your country and in mine, that has not happened for decades now. Uh, you have people coming illegally across the southern border in huge numbers every single day. I don't believe any Americans voted to have an open border uh, in, in that area. I don't believe anyone in the United Kingdom voted to have people coming across the, uh, the channel uh, in boats escaping the war-torn country of France. Uh, I don't think any of us uh, voted for any of these um, changes that were implemented without our consent. And I'm someone who is a first generation immigrant to the UK. I came here in 1995. At that point, 3% of the British public thought that immigration was a major issue because it wasn't a major issue. <laughs> the levels of immigration into Britain were quite manageable. Everything was going absolutely fine. Nobody had any great concerns about what was happening. And then you get to the early noughties, the late 90s, early noughties, when Tony Blair comes to power. And Tony Blair says, well, we must join the European Union. And by the way, we're going to suspend any temporary transitional controls, unlike every other country in the European Union. So when new countries that join the EU, uh, uh, like Poland, Romania, etc., join, accede to the European Union, we will not, we will be one of the two countries, us and Ireland, who do not int introduce transitional controls. And they said 13,000 people a year would come. Uh, in the first couple of years, a million people came. Wow. So these large wow. disruptions, uh, whether you, you like Polish people as I do and think that they're really hardworking and they, they've come here and contributed brilliantly uh, to society or not, you cannot deny that, that that process is disruptive. Now, look, if the British public get together and say, this is what we want, we want a million people from Eastern Europe to come to our country every year to help run our national health service, to help pick our fruit, to help, you know, serve, uh, serve us in restaurants, then I, I'm a Democrat, it's small d Democrat. I believe that people should get what they voted for. And if that's what they vote for, that's what should happen. The problem is, in both our countries, uh, the public are not getting what they voted for. Instead, they're getting some sort of, you know, half-assed solution in, in, in where they end up with people coming into the country 
ahead of people who've actually done the right thing, who filled out the right paperwork, who followed all the rules. You get people coming in illegally and there are politicians and all sorts of other institutions that seem to be covering for that. That is a big, big problem. Whatever you think about, you know, you could want billions of people to be free. You could believe in open borders, frankly, and still think that people breaking the law to get into your country should be illegal. So that's my primary concern. Now, as for my own view on immigration, uh, my own view of immigration is that it should be um, it should be reasonable and decided, as I say, democratically. But to me, the, the numbers should be such that they benefit the host country. That's what, I mean, that's what it's all about. We should take a, a number of refugees, genuine refugees who come because we are able to. Although, you know, as someone who has family who are refugees right now fleeing Ukraine, I do think quite often uh, there's, you know, our reason for allowing people to come to the US and the UK is more about our guilt than it is about the practical reality of what benefits them. Uh, frequently, refugees are best placed in nearby countries because most of them would actually quite like to return to their country once hopefully the war is over, which is the case with all the overwhelming majority of Ukrainians. Um, but in terms of just legal immigration, I think you know we should decide as a society who and how many people we want, and then make sure that those are the only people who are coming in. Uh, and uh, you know, I don't see, for example, why we should have a situation as we do here in the UK, where we have frequent terrorist attacks committed by people who came into this country without being checked at all. I don't see why the British public should be should be put in that position. Uh, that doesn't make any sense to me. And as I say, nobody voted for it. Hmm. Since we're doing an issue on nationalism, how do you think of a nation? I mean, is it a group of, is it the common language? Is it common norms? Uh, is it geographical borders? I mean, these are all kind of fuzzy sets where there's a lot of overlap and, and blending into one another. How do, how do you think about that? Well, it depends on the nation, doesn't it? I mean, I think the Japanese have their conception of the nation, which is pretty... Mm. Um, there's not a lot of inclusion going on there, and I, I'm a big fan of Japan <laughs> no. and, and uh, their culture. You know, one of the things that was, it was, a, I don't know if you've been to Japan, but it's such a shock going to Japan as a Westerner uh, because you feel like a complete barbarian, and, and it's an entirely appropriate feeling, you know. And so I sort of understand, you know, people talk, oh, the Japanese think they're superior to everybody. Well, they are. <laughs> Why wouldn't they, you know? But 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 they think of a nation very much in ethnic terms. And there are many countries around the world that, that think about it in that way too. Uh, equally, there are more imperial countries uh, or countries that have a history of imperialism, like Britain, like the United States, like Russia, by the way, uh, which have a much more inclusive vision, ironically. Even Russia, which is a deeply racist country, of course, uh, there is no... Because it's an empire and not a country, there's a sort of feeling that, well, you know, we may not be ethnically Russian, but we're all part of the the Russian idea, the Russian nation. And so in the UK, it seems to me the way I think about it, first and foremost, is it's not about your skin color or your ethnicity. What it's about is, do you speak the language and do you buy into the values and do you live in this society? And are you willing to make yourself part of this society? That's the beauty to me of the American uh, structure, particularly the melting pot idea, was look, you, you, you may be of whatever descent that you are and your wife is of whatever descent that she is. And if I ever come and live in America, I'll be of the descent that I am. And we are, you know, African American, even though I hate that term personally, but, you know, German American or Irish American or Italian American, we're all American. That's the way I think about it. And so uh, that's to me, the way that we should all be thinking about it in the societies that are multi-ethnic like the ones that you and I live in. And it's likewise in Britain, you know, the, the, the idea that you're only British if you were born here and you can trace your lineage back to William the Conqueror seems to me a bit silly. Uh, I think in, in a society that particularly is descended from a, a large imperial nation, what should determine whether you're British or not is first and foremost, are you willing to speak the, the, the English language and make yourself part of the society and subscribe to its core tenets and values. Uh, and I believe that's the case in America too, at least what we, in its sort of idealistic conception. I think this, this idea underlies some of what's behind the war in Ukraine. You know, to what extent are Ukrainians part of the West uh, or are they Russian? Is it this Donbass region, they, they really are Russian and they want to be part of Russia? Or is that a bunch of bullshit we're getting from Putin's uh, 
you know, PR people or, you know, and I don't know what to make of that because I only can access the, you know, Western media. How do you think about that in terms of this kind of nationalism idea? Is there an argument well, to be made that some of those Ukrainians should be in Russia? Well, of course, there are, uh, I have members of my own family in, in Russia and in Ukraine, and I have family members who, who are in Ukraine, who are Russian speakers, who, who are not ethnic Ukrainians. By the way, most of them support Ukraine's uh, position and Ukraine's defense in this, it, after being invaded. But there are people undoubtedly in Ukraine, a small minority of people, uh, who were there. You've you got to understand, it's like um, if, if, the, if the United States was to, to split in two, let's say, there would be a lot of Iowans who happened to be living in Texas at the time of the split. Uh, I'm not sure that would necessarily entitle Iowa to invade Texas, even if that's geographically possible. My American geography is not not, not particularly good. So, so probably not geographically possible. But you see what I'm saying? There were people who were left over in Ukraine uh, because the Soviet Union was a country that mixed. And uh, Ukraine has a long and complicated history. Uh, but the idea that uh, that this invasion is predicated on, which is that Russian speakers in eastern Ukraine and Donbass were oppressed or discriminated against, is complete garbage. Um, my most of my family, pretty much, in fact, all of my family, uh, and I have people in the north, in the south, in the east, and the west of Ukraine. They're all Russian speakers, and overwhelmingly supported Ukraine, started learning Ukrainian, ironically, to the point where they will deliberately speak their terrible Ukrainian to be to show their allegiance to the country, even though they're actually naturally Russian speakers. Uh, they were, and by the way, there are people who were more pro-Russian before they saw what Russia is doing. Uh, I had an interesting conversation with a very close friend of mine who was very pro-Russian and when I called him up on the day on, of the invasion, I said, how, how are things going? And he said, everything is going as it should. Well, doesn't think that way three months later or six months later at all, let me tell you. Um, so, but of course, uh, the Russian version of this story is very much this because, uh, you know, they, they, the, the uh, Sergei Shoigu, the, the, the Russian defense minister, was speaking uh, to his generals earlier this month and he basically said, yeah, we're rebuilding this, the USSR and everything will be fine. Uh, the speech that Vladimir Putin gave on the night before the invasion, had there was nothing, there was almost nothing about this fake genocide in the Donbass or whatever. It was all about how, how basically uh, Ukraine had been unfairly split off from the Russian Empire and later the Soviet Union and things had been given it to, to, to Ukraine that didn't belong to it and so on and so forth. And Russian soldiers bled for this land and now it's been given away to these uh, people. So um, it's, it, it's it, the imperial project is very much upon us. It's, uh, it's the idea of rebuilding the empire uh, and all of this other bullshit that you keep hearing from these supposed dissident voices in the West who are just uh, clearly, you see, this is what people don't understand. All you have to do is watch Russian television for about five minutes because you, you need to speak Russian for this and have access to it to understand where all these brilliant dissidents in the West are getting their incredibly insightful information from. They're just rehashing the same thing. And there is a... I haven't talked about this in public, but there's a very interesting, uh, like RT to Western dissident, uh, dissident uh, like pipeline, which I've observed in action almost like live. It's fascinating. So uh, a few months ago, there was a missile strike uh, on a railroad hub in Donbass in eastern Ukraine, in which a number of civilians were killed by a Tochka U, the Russian called Tochka U missile, and Within a few seconds of this being published, I saw that Russian propaganda channels were putting this out. And then within a few more seconds, I saw that there's, there's this guy who I won't even bother naming because I don't want to give him any attention. But this guy, so he was a pickup artist who then moved to Kharkov in Ukraine, in northern Ukraine. And he was doing his brilliant pickup artistry there, tricking women into sleeping with him or whatever, or teaching other guys to do that. Uh, and then suddenly he became an expert on uh, Russian Ukrainian military politics. And the, the several days before the invasion, he said that nobody in their right mind thinks that Russia would invade. And of course, the next day, Russia invaded. Uh, but anyway, when this missile strike happened, within a few minutes, he posted on Twitter and on his Telegram channel 
that this missile is not in Russia's arsenal. Now, I don't know how a pickup artist familiarizes himself with Russia's missile arsenal, but he somehow did, uh, despite the fact that Russia, the Russian Defense YouTube, uh, Defense Force YouTube channel had a, a video of them firing this missile still live on their YouTube channel, right? So this guy is clearly getting his information from somewhere. He's not himself deciding whether Russia has this missile or not, and he's not doing any fact checking. He just takes what RT posts or whatever posts, puts it in the Western domain and feeds it to people who are so disillusioned. And by the way, rightly so with Western mainstream media uh, that they're lapping this stuff up. So this is what people I don't think understand particularly well about what's happening in Russia and Ukraine at the moment. There's two wars going on. There's the kinetic war on the ground. And then there's the propaganda war that is being waged very effectively and very aggressively against gullible people here in the West in order to persuade them that this is yet another issue in which the mainstream media is lying. And unfortunately, it's, it's quite difficult to argue against because the mainstream media has been lying on many, many important issues over recent years. So in other words, the Russian people themselves probably think this is a good idea, this is normal, uh, Ukraine does belong part of our country, and so on, because they're only getting that perspective. Yeah. Well, uh, give the, you the Russian of this. perspective... I, uh, Go for yeah, it, sorry. Well, when I was in Moscow, uh, I saw that there's a huge World War II museum, and I love all that World War II stuff, and I go to all the museums I can. So when I went there, and the first thing I noticed is it's not a World War II museum. It's the Great Patriotic War Museum, right? And from their perspective, you know, World War II is not at all what we think it is. They think of it, they pretty much single-handedly stopped the Nazis themselves. And when you look at the number of deaths, casualties and deaths, you know, they have this huge room with this giant ceiling with these uh, crystal beads hanging down. Each bead is like 10,000 deaths or whatever. And each string of beads is like 100,000 people that died. And the entire ceiling is filled with these things with lights lighting them up. It's really quite dramatic. What was it, like 27 million died, uh, Russians died in, in the Second World War uh, versus America. It, was, it wasn't even half a million casualties in, in the UK, even less. So I, I can kind of see from their perspective, yeah, that, that's a very different view of history than what we have in the West. And, mm. and therefore, not accurate, I, you know, it's to... not accurate, though, Michael, because, uh, look, the Soviet Union, my great grandfather died defending the Soviet Union, along with many others. And, and the, the heroism of all the people who helped stop Nazism is un, beyond question. But uh, you, you have to understand this sort of counting the dead is sort of like measuring the outcome of an NFL game by who, which side got the most concussions. It's not really how you do it, right? Uh, the, the, the Nazis were defeated by the combined forces of three great empires. I'm a big World War II buff, as you're about to tell. Uh, the, the British Empire, the American Empire, and the Soviet Empire. These three forces together combined and worked very, very hard and, and lost a lot to to stop the Nazis. Now, yes, the Eastern Front was the most brutal, but one of the reasons it was the most brutal was Soviet tactics. It was sending men into machine gun, uh, into well-fortified machine gun positions uh, with no regard for their lives whatsoever. Uh, and of course, the Soviet Union would have been completely unable to defend itself against Nazism had it not been for the tremendous support that lend provided and for the fact that, of course, Germany was having to fight a war on two fronts. Uh, and so the Battle of Kursk, for example, which the Soviets rightly considered regard as a huge turning point in the war, was happening at the very same time that German cities were being wiped off the face of the earth by Allied bombing attacks. If, what do you think the Germans cared more about? Some battle in some nowhere in, in, far east or in, in the far east of their periphery or their cities being wiped off the map and German children burning alive and fire bombings? I think so. The, the Soviet narrative and the Russian narrative about it is very one-sided. Now, you could argue the Western narrative is also one-sided too. And the truth lies somewhere in the middle, which is the three, these three great empires work together to defeat Nazism. But I, I, coming back to how we started this conversation, this part of the conversation, yeah, of course, uh, the Russian narrative is going to be the Russian narrative. But you've got to remember uh, that in a dictatorship like the one that Russia has today, uh, narratives are even more important because they feed the political structure. Let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, think about this. In the 90s, Russia is liberalizing. It's a very difficult and painful process, which is one of the reasons you get 
a hard man like Putin being, you know, being welcome in because he stabilizes the country. I have a whole uh, st- sub stack about this, which is called the why Russians uh, support Putin. And uh, he comes in and he stabilizes the country. But think about this. Vladimir Putin has been in power since 1999. We were worried when he came to power, I always say this, we were worried about the millennium bugs. He's had plenty of time. Uh, and, you know, from the democratic and constitutional norms that were in place in Russia at the time, he should have stopped being president over a decade ago. Uh, and he's manipulated all the rules to remain in power. Now, if you are if you are destroying the, the, the sort of fledging democratic institutions of your country, how do you explain this to the public? Well, one of the best ways to explain it, why do you need a strong man like Putin once the economy is recovered, once life is stabilized, why everything is, once everything is great, by the sort of late noughties, for example, when everything is going just about fine. uh, Why do you still need Putin? Well, you don't, actually. If you're comfortable, if your life is predictable, if the economy is doing great, oil prices have never been higher, everything's brilliant. You don't need a strong man dictator in place who's going to, you know, give all, all the money to his pals and, uh, you know, make oligarchs out of his the guy who used to clean his car and all this sort of stupid stuff. Why do you need him? Well, what if we say that the evil West is about to attack us and destroy us? Suddenly, you have a very good idea why you need Putin. Putin will defend us against the evil West. So this narrative about history and history is being rewritten all the time in Russia. It's against the law, for example, in Russia to compare what the Nazis did with what the Soviets did, even though what the Soviets did in many ways was actually far worse, uh, killing millions of their own citizens, not another ethnicity or tribe that they hated with a passion, but actually their own people, their own people, just because they had the wrong opinion or because they refused to comply or because they had the wrong ethnicity or they they came from one wave of communism and not another or they were Trotskyists and not Lenin, all of this stuff. Uh, It is illegal in Russia to make any allusions to that. It is illegal in Russia to make any comparisons between Russia, the Soviet Union and the Nazis, even though World War II started, Michael, and you know this, I'm sure, with the Soviets and the Nazis dividing Eastern Europe between each other, invading uh, (laughs) Poland, invading and taking over Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, a bit of Bessarabia, a bit of uh, other parts of, of Eastern Europe and Southern Europe and massacring many of the local elites, intellectuals, uh, and so on, and so on, the priesthood, and so on, and so forth. Even though that is all a fact, it is illegal to make this comparison. So history is a weapon, uh, always has been, and is being used today in order to justify uh, the leadership and the regime that exists there, and to allow them to continue rebuilding the empire. Yeah. So, from the Russian perspective on the West, do they have any argument that NATO is a threat? I mean, at least from their perspective, it looks well, like we're course. constantly well, building course, up. As I explained, of course, NATO is a threat uh, and it helps them to think that way because it justifies uh, the existence of this strongman leader who's going to rebuild the military, etc. Um, I think we all know, uh, living in the West, that there's very little intention of anybody in Britain or in America or whatever to, to invade Russia or to attack Russia or whatever. Uh, people are quite happy to trade with Russia, as we're discovering Russia is an important part of the global economy. And the Western model is very simple. Let's do business together. Uh, let's not poison each other's former citizens in each other's streets with radioactive poison. Uh, and let's just get on with life. Uh, I mean, here in, in London, uh, we we spent many decades laundering Russian oligarchs' money through our financial and legal systems with no complaint whatsoever. This idea that we were about to destroy Russia, completely absurd. But but it serves the Russian elite to spread this narrative because it helps them justify their own existence and justify their imperial ambitions. Why do you suppose Putin didn't just take the Donbass region like he did the Crimea and, and, then, just, and then just go back? And the West probably wouldn't have done anything like we usually don't. Um, and instead, he does the full-on invasion, and now we, you know, pretty much have to do something. Well, he tried in 2014, if you remember, when they took Crimea. They also tried to take all of the Donbass, uh, but they couldn't do it because the Ukrainians defended it. And so, 
that's why this war essentially started is they were trying to capture the rest of those areas and of course since you're going to war you might as well take all of eastern ukraine with it because remind you you're trying to recapture uh, the 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 imperial lands of ukraine so that's why i think it's happened they tried in 2014 didn't quite work and they were always going to come back for more all right let's um well let me just ask you what do you think the outcomes of all this is going to be you think he'll just press on for years and it could just drag out uh for an indefinite period of time or you think he'll give up i think it's very difficult to say and it depends very much on what happens first of all on the ground obviously how the war is going right now the way the war is going is there is a it's not a stalemate because russia is continuing to inch forward slowly uh and both sides are taking very heavy casualties um but uh, it also depends on what happens uh internationally what is the resolve of the western powers one of the things that the russians are desperately trying to do is to blackmail uh european nations like germany particularly which have deliberately over time uh partly due to the corrupt links between the elites in germany and uh, the russian uh, regime uh to make germany more dependent on russian gas over time shutting down the nuclear power stations etc and so what the russians would like to do in an ideal world is force Germany basically into a very difficult choice. Either you continue, uh, I mean, they've been quite weak anyway, but either you continue to support NATO and your pensioners uh, freeze to death in the winter, or uh, you bend the knee, you undermine Western efforts to support Ukraine, and then you can have all the gas that you want. That is the game that's being played. How either of those things plays out is difficult to say, and primarily it depends on uh, what support the Americans are willing to provide in terms of the hardware because uh, some of the latest heavy weaponry is making a big difference. You're seeing uh, strikes in Crimea, you're seeing strikes in, in eastern Ukraine. Uh, there was a missile strike recently, or a HIMARS, I think it would have been, uh, that destroyed the headquarters of the Wagner uh, private military contractor headquarters, and they're doing a lot of the fighting in the east right now. And uh, the HIMARS are basically uncounterable. So if the West continues to provide this sort of weaponry, uh, the Ukrainians have a very good op uh, good opportunity to... Uh, I don't know whether, you know, I, I don't know that this war ends with, you know, the Ukrainian flag being raised above the Kremlin. And I don't, I wouldn't like to see that either, frankly. But, but what it could do is inflict such heavy casualties on the Russians that they have to settle for what they've got now, or even perhaps have to settle for what they have when the casualties have been incurred so it remains to be seen whether the ukrainians are going to be able to push them back because it remains to be seen how much more support they are going to get from the west um but i've said from day one and i mean day one that however this ends um ukraine will not be a viable state whatever shape that country is in at the time unless it has physical security guarantees in place and i'm talking peacekeepers in place uh because otherwise what is there to stop ukraine from being invaded again a few years down the line when the west you know another COVID happens or we suddenly you know decide that we need to spend two years talking about how we're the most racist people in the world and we take our eye off the ball in that way or we decide you know we've got to have another election in the united states where no one believes that either side got elected or whatever right um and so these opportunities will be there for the people who want to take advantage this is uh one of the things i talk about in an immigrant's love letter to the west michael i don't know if i'm allowed to swear i won't uh but we well, don't have can, time sure. to mess around <laughs> we don't have time to mess right. around uh you know we've got enemies and they are aware of the weakness of our societies they're aware of the division in our societies now fortunately they like me by the way massively overestimated the extent of that division i've been very pleasantly surprised by the strong response that the west has given to what's happened uh and what is potentially happening in 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 taiwan um but we don't have time we do not have time to mess around uh we have to remember that nobody no empire lasts forever no hegemony lasts forever and the barbarians are at the gates. They're aware of what's happening and they've been fueling this for a long time. As you know, the Russian troll farms, the Chinese are doing everything they can to accelerate divisions in the West. Uh, we've got to reject that. We've got to say, you know what? We're not ashamed of who we are in the West. 
We're not ashamed of our history. We are aware of the negative parts of our history. We're aware of the positive parts of our history. We are proud of who we are, warts and all. Uh, we uh, are one of the few societies in the history of the world that's actually eventually got round to the idea that people should be treated on the content of their character and not the colour of their skin or their gender or their sexuality. One of the very few societies that's ever even tried this. And we are going to double down on that instead of regressing to this idea that people should be treated on the basis of their tribal identity. Mm -hmm. Well, so you have a chapter called Stop Feeling Guilty About Race, Whiteness and Slavery, <laughs> which I liked, of course, because I'm a white guy. But I wonder I what that's about. Of... <laughs> As you know, there's massive racial divide here. Uh, again, one of the observations from, from Jennifer coming from Germany is you know, you just watching uh, media and, and television shows and the news and so on. It's all Americans talk about is race, just black and white, black and white. Everything is race. And well, I guess that's because of our history. Right. I mean, it's it's uh, it, it is our original sin. So what's wrong with, I guess, confronting that directly? And and how far do you go? You know, critical race theory is, you know, being taught in high school. OK, middle school. OK, grammar school. Well, that's not really critical race theory. That's something that, well, I don't care what you call it, right? At, you know, at what point is it age appropriate for people to confront our, our dark history? And there are still issues, right, that, you know, the mm -hmm. people that study Absolutely. systemic racism, for example, point out that there are huge income differences, black-white income differences, housing ownership, home ownership and housing uh, quality, um, you know, employment opportunities. and healthcare outcome differences. And, you know, it just goes on and on. And now, of course, I don't go as far as someone like Ibram X. Kendi that just says everything is race, it's all racism, and that's it. There are no other causes. But I can see room for some systemic racist arguments like redlining and housing, which is now illegal. But over the long run, those neighborhoods back in the 40s and 50s that were redlined, you know, we're depressed and they're still depressed. They're, they're, you know, they're crappy neighborhoods. The schools are no good. The pollution, you know, it's just on and on. And it maybe it just takes generations to get past this and we just have to keep chipping away at it. Uh, but of course, the reparations people and so on want to say, no, 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 we, we need to do something more than that. We need to, you know, government needs to step in and, and uh, you know, give a, a more, you know, affirmative action, more helping hand from the Know, great society of the 60s we need another push like that okay so give us your thoughts on the american racist racism issue yeah well you've got two points there that i think are important to separate so the first is the history how do we reckon with the history of the united states and the british empire and so on and the second is how do we deal with the fact that certain communities certain ethnic groups uh, continue to be underprivileged in our society, right? So let's, let's take those two separate and start with the history one. So the history one, I am all for the teaching of slavery. In fact, I think we don't teach about it nearly enough because if we did, we would teach about the history of slavery around the world and throughout the history of the human race. And one of the best educations that you can get on this is to read anything by a guy called Orlando Patterson or Thomas Sowell in where they talk about the history of slavery around the world. Slavery is... Slaves, human beings, are the oldest good that has ever been traded between other human beings. It has been with us since forever. Every great civilization in history has used them. And at exactly the same time that the colonial powers were taking slaves out of Africa, Middle Eastern slave traders were taking more slaves out of Africa, treating them worse. More of them were dying, etc. And at the same time, my ancestors in Russia were living as slaves, as serfs in the Russian Empire. Then under the Soviet Union, many of them lived in gulags and as slaves for the construction of all sorts of infrastructure in the far east of Russia and Siberia. And around every other part of the world, slavery was happening at exactly the same time in the same way or worse. Now, the transatlantic slave trade, which is what people in the West talk about when they talk about slavery, which is what they mean when they talk about slavery, uh, was uniquely bad because the technology of that time allowed people to put people on large ships and transport them across the ocean. And that meant that it was worse. Um, but that wasn't any different to what anybody else would have done if they had the technology to do it, right? So the West's history of slavery is terrible and at exactly as terrible as every other society in the history of the world. So we should teach fully 
about slavery and reckon with our history of slavery in the same way that we reckon with the history of slavery uh, in other countries. So that's the first thing on the slavery thing. In terms of people being underprivileged as a, as a result of objectively racist policy, uh, well, the first step we've got to do, and largely it's done, is to remove uh, any racist policies and laws off the books. I think it's fair to say that the United States and the UK have gone all the way on that and frankly have gone in the reverse direction in many in many situations. Does that address the fact that these communities are still underprivileged? No, it doesn't. Uh, what does, I think, help, though, is to focus on this issue as a class thing because here in the UK, and it's also true to some extent in America, people from West Africa, immigrants from West Africa, are some of the most successful people uh, in the history of this country. They earn the most money, they're the best educated, they do the best at school, they have the best health outcome, etc., etc., etc. Right. So it's not about your skin color; it's about where you live, where you grew up, did you come from an intact family, and so on and so forth. And because of that, the way to address this issue is not through the lens of race; it's through the lens of class, i.e., economic situation. Where are you coming from? How did you grow up? What community you were born in, etc. Because I imagine the people that you guys derog in the call white trash in this derogatory way have just about as hard a life as the people who are growing up in the inner city who are from a minority background. So it's a class issue. Is Did you go to a good school? Did you have a father in the home? Are you surrounded by criminals? Did you get a good education? Uh, did you get the right food and nutrition when you were a kid? These things will determine your outcomes in life far more than race. And just like in the UK, you know, Japanese American, Chinese Americans, they do incredibly well in your society. So it's not about ethnicity or race necessarily. A lot of this is about class. We had all sorts of reports into this. We had the, the, the race and disparity report here in the UK, which found that there's a huge difference between people of Caribbean origin and immigrants from Africa who've come in recent decades. So there's a historical element. There's also culture. There's family structure. There's nutrition. There's all sorts of things. And those things are best addressed without looking at people's skin color and by looking at their actual circumstances and addressing those and helping people. If you want to help people, the best thing to do is to find people who are poor, who've got a bad school, who are surrounded by, who live in a criminal neighborhood and help them get out of that situation or improve the situation where they live, forgetting about their race, which is, by the way, the American ideal. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, I think a lot of those Trump voters in 2016 from the Midwest, which is pretty white, uh, who felt left behind. That is, they didn't recover from the 2008-2009 meltdown and, and recession. They didn't have stocks in the stock market that bounced back during Obama's administration and continues. Uh, you know, they uh, so when they're told you have white privilege and, you know, you've been handed this silver platter, they're looking around going, what are you talking about? I, uh, you know, I'm dirt poor. My schools are crappy and, and there's no blacks here. This is not a race issue for them. Well, I agree. Now, I wouldn't necessarily compare those people to someone, you know, living in a crime infested neighborhood in the, in the city. I think uh, I, while I understand their frustrations, I don't know that it was necessarily the same. Or I certainly wouldn't say it was the same. And look, we, we, we're going quite deep into American politics. I'm always wary of talking about it because having been to America several times, uh, my greatest takeaway is that just because the same we speak the same language doesn't mean that we understand each other's countries all that well and our cultures are not necessarily the same in fact they're really not the same uh, but yeah i think uh, i think these issues are best addressed by looking at people's actual circumstances as opposed to judging people on the color of their skin i think that's unwise i think that's divisive and frankly it doesn't help those people mm. All right, let's talk about language. I loved your chapter on how language is used to distort the truth. Let's start with the origins of the of the phrase political correctness. Mm. I love that section. Very, very few people in the West, or frankly anywhere else, know where it comes from. But of course, like many of the things that we're doing now in society, Michael, it comes from uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, in the Soviet Union, my ancestors would be told, Comrade, you cannot say this. This is factually correct, but politically incorrect. And what that meant was you were going against the party line of the day. You were going against what you were supposed to say, even though you knew it was wrong. Uh, I don't think that sounds all that unfamiliar to people living in the modern West. So that's where political correctness comes from. It's a, it's a way of enforcing 
a certain dogma and ideology on society. Um, and one of the worrying things to me as well is that we've seen not only the introduction of speech codes and political correctness, but a very rapid substitution of meaning. Rogan and I talked about this, you know, uh, when we talk about safety now, safety doesn't mean what safety used to mean. Safety has a very uh, normal definition. The absence of physical violence is what safety means. However, if you can rephrase, reframe safety to mean the absence of opinions you don't like, it becomes very, very easy to enforce uh, speech codes and censorship on people because you're no longer saying, you're saying something I don't like, shut up, you're, uh, which nobody would respect. You're saying, you're making me unsafe and you must be prevented from speaking. That is a much more persuasive argument. And all sorts of other things. Inclusion is my favorite as well. We talk about, you know, we must have an inclusive space. Well, people like me and you and Francis and Rogan and whoever else wouldn't be all that included in one of these inclusive spaces. In fact, you might find yourself rather excluded if you were to show up and perhaps even somewhat unsafe in the old definition of the term. Uh, and whatever, wherever you look, th this is happening. I, um, I give the example in the book of a member of parliament here in the UK who said that we must not fetishize debate. And what she meant by that is we shouldn't debate things, uh, even though she's a member of parliament, the British parliament, the oldest or one of the oldest debating chambers in the world, uh, because she'd rather people didn't have conversations because then maybe some of her terrible ideas would be exposed. Uh, and so we are redefining language to facilitate this cultural revolution that is happening uh, under the surface. So I, I love this section in your book here. Uh, I famously lost a stand-up comedy gig with the University of London in 2018 because I refused to sign a safe space agreement, which banned me from making jokes related to racism, sexism, classism, ageism, homophobia, biphobia, xenophobia, Islamophobia, anti-religion, in anti-atheism what left is there to do for a stand-up comedy routine if you can't touch any well, of that right and you, yeah and you left out ableism as well so you're a bigot michael oh ableism, uh, yeah right. that's yeah yeah exactly uh, but uh yeah of course it, it, it's absurd and i you know i turned it down because i just thought this was silly and w what was interesting about that story is i kind of thought that i'm one of these like weird comedians with my soviet background who's really hypersensitive to all this stuff and really most of the public couldn't care less and don't give a shit and whatever but what happened is i tweeted about it to like a thousand people uh at the time i had like a thousand followers or something you know very very low number if you got picked up you got picked up in america then here then around the world and before i knew it it was the second most read story on the BBC News website on the day that the prime minister of our country was nearly removed from office by her own party. So that would be the equivalent of the Democrats impeaching Joe Biden right now. And the second story on CNN and Fox is like a comedian no one's ever heard of turns down unpaid gig from some no name university. And that's when I realized, Michael, that it's not just silly comedians like me or, you know, former Soviet citizens like me who care about this issue. Actually, the general public really do feel very strongly about this issue. And that is because, and I give this, these numbers in the first, in the preface to the book, most people in our society, in the United States, in the United Kingdom, now live as if they've signed that contract and they're careful about what they say. The 77% of Republicans, nearly 60% of independents and over half of Democrats in the United States, according to the polling that I include in the book, uh, feel unable or fearful of expressing their political opinions in public. Over half, including over half of Democrats and nearly 80% of Republicans. And in the UK, the situation is very similar and the trend is worrying as well because the number of people who feel restricted is rising. The number of people who feel able to say what they think is falling. So we are implementing some of these ideas uh, and people are seeing the result. People are worried in the UK. We have laws on the books now that say that it is illegal to be grossly offensive, for example. And people are regularly investigated and prosecuted and convicted by the police of speech offenses. Comedians are investigated for their jokes. Uh, and the police literally will turn up at a comedian's door and say, we are investigating whether your joke is illegal. 
I mean, what world are we living in? Mm -hmm. Well, as you know, one of the pushbacks against that argument from progressives is that you just don't like being told you can't be racist, homophobic, misogynistic, anti-Semitic, and so on. Uh, these are just normal trends that we should implement because this is good for moral progress. Well, they're right. You know, I do want to advance my Jewish Nazi agenda, as, as somebody has accused me of in the past. But uh, the, this is the, the cheap argument that people always wheel out. when they're, and, and by the way, this argument has been made hundreds of times by people on, that, on this side, that side of the argument in the past. It's not just progressives. People have made it all along. You know, you just want to violate all our moral codes. And that's why. No. No, yes, some the, the idea of free speech allows some people to say things that we would all dislike, but that is the price we pay for living in a free society. It's the price we pay for the scientific progress, for the technological uh, progress that we've made. It is the price we pay for living in one of the most prosperous societies in the world. And if you compare us to societies that do restrict what comedians are allowed to joke about, to societies that do restrict what people are allowed to say about politics in public, that do restrict the opinions that you're allowed to have or try to force certain opinions down your throat, which of those societies would you like to live in? And if you would like to live in North Korea or modern Russia or China, by all means, I, I will personally fund your ticket to go and live in those societies as long as it's one way. And the problem I have with these people is none of them ever volunteered to do this. None of them ever volunteered to go and live in these ideal societies like the ones that they want, because in their mind, these things are not connected, but they are connected. They are connected. If you restrict people's freedoms, you will also end up in a society where their freedoms are restricted. It's not rocket science. Right. So as a comedian, where do you draw the line of the kind of language you would use? The obvious one being, would you use the N-word in a routine as a white guy? Uh, I don't even like to use the word ever, and I think that's okay. Uh, but maybe that's the only example uh, where we should have restrictions. Are there others? I don't know. How do you think about just kind of personal self-regulation of language? Hmm. Uh, I think it's up to each individual comedian to decide what they think they should and could do, uh, because uh, comedy is a very powerful tool and you can use it uh, to set things up. So I, for example, would never use the N-word ever. But in my last hour special that I did, I had a 20 minute routine which culminated with me using it in a very specific context which I, in which I illustrated that just because a word is offensive doesn't mean it can never be used by a person of a different color. And I did it deliberately and it takes 20 minutes. It takes 20 minutes and a lot of goodwill from people and a lot of jokes and a lot of explanation to get to the point where people will go along with you on that. Right. It's not because I was trying to justify people using the N word. I think people who, who, who would use that word in everyday life. Uh, are wrong and and frankly I do think it would be racist to do that but if you're a comedian on stage as part of a comedy routine different things are possible so I think it's up to each individual comedian to draw the line for themselves I mean famous George Carlin one of my great heroes a, a very progressive a left-wing guy by the way he had a whole routine about how you should be able to use the n-word if you remember now would he be able to do that now probably not uh, should he be able to do that now well I think it should be up to him right and, by the way, this is what people never understand about comedy. Comedy is incredibly self-regulating. Incredibly self-regulating. Unless you're doing gigs to the annual meeting of the KKK, which I don't believe has stand-up comedy, um, that, then you are going to be in a position where you're playing to a general mix of the, the general public. And they are going to let you know pretty quickly if you've crossed the line and that's how comedians learn. You might say something that's over the line. You go, oh, they didn't like that. OK, I need another joke to follow this up or I need to pull back or I need to reword or I need to rephrase or I need to maybe cut that bit if, if, it's, if I can't get it to work. That is the process of comedy. You go out, you say some stupid shit. Some of it works. You go out and you make it slightly less stupid and slightly more funny. Try it again. And on and on it goes. And that's the process of comedy. So the problem we have, and you know, when we spoke to Lionel Shriver, the, the, the brilliant author uh, on trigonometry, she made the point that we don't even know what books aren't being written, what comedy routines aren't being performed, because everyone is fearful of crossing that line now, because you cross it once, someone puts it out on YouTube, and you all, you're done as this racist guy. You know the famous routine that Chris Rock had about uh, uh, black people versus the N-word, right? 
You remember this? Um, well, he it, uh, he talks about how it took him months, I think, to get that to work. So he had to go out month after month and die on his ass, as we say in the British comedy industry, doing that routine, being misunderstood, potentially liable to being misrepresented. But if he was living through the smartphone social media age, I don't even know that that routine ever gets made. And what a great loss that would have been to, to, to the, the history of comedy. Here's a definition of a safe space. When you tell a joke, uh, Will Smith can't get up and slap you across the face. <laughs> 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 yeah. Or worse, Dave Chappelle can't be attacked or even worse, Salman Rushdie. Now that is yeah. violence. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and uh, by the way, I actually read a brilliant piece from Sarah Haider. I don't know if you've had her on the show, uh, no, in I which she talks she about, is. you haven't, yeah. I, I, well, I'd like to get her on trigonometry and I, 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 she'd be a great guest for you to talk with as well, because she wrote this brilliant piece in which she actually says that our belief that what happens to Salman Rushdie and other people who criticize and mock Islam or certain facets of Islam or Islamists, uh, we are wrong to believe that that is about causing offense. Actually, she says, Islamists are deliberately using our belief that, you know, being offended or being offensive is wrong uh, to cover up for the fact that in their worldview, it's not about causing offense. It's about violating the religious laws of Islam. In other words, it's about blaspheming. It's not about being offensive. And this is something that is being used against us because we've become so pathetic and defending our own values of free speech because it's much easier for us to say well look we don't have blasphemy laws in the west so this is your problem but if they say no 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 this isn't about us trying to enforce our religious dogma on you this is about the fact that you've offended muslims that sounds a lot more persuasive to the western ear and that's why you know we've got to be careful as i say about russia and china etc but also uh, against this ideology got to be careful that we do not allow people who hate everything we stand for to use our own stupidity against us. And we are allowing them to do that at the moment. Mm. So maybe an example of that would be the reaction to that Washington Post journalist who retweeted that joke, all women are bi, it's just the question of our sexual or, or polar. And, and then, you know, the, he had a, you know, kind of a mobbed uh, attack that went on for almost two weeks until they finally got rid of the woman who was going after him. Would that be an example? I mean, first, would you use a joke like that? Is that crossing the line or is that just a stupid throwaway joke, a dad joke, uh, and it's not a big deal or, you know, that I mean, the left, look, maybe a guy saying to... women are crazy is not exactly the most original joke that anyone's ever made. <laughs> like right. it's been a staple of comedy for a while. Uh, right. And, uh, I'm going to be honest with you. If women make jokes about men, it doesn't particularly offend me. If guys make jokes about women, is that the way that I would personally phrase it? I, I do think it's a clever joke, for sure. It's a clever joke in that it, it uses language well. And that, to me, is always the sign of a, of a well-written joke. So I can appreciate a joke that I disagree with for the structure and the way that it's it's written. Uh, I, I definitely don't think someone should lose their career for making a joke and uh, to have your own colleagues uh, essentially attacking the institution for which you both work in order to get rid of you. That seemed to me quite incredible. But and by the way, Michael, I think that case brings up something that I think is actually really important, which is what happened in the end, which is the stupid woman who was having a go at him got fired, should have happened day one. Day one. If this was my company, Day one, you get a warning. Stop bad-mouthing the company in public. If you have an internal dispute, come in. We'll resolve it as best we can. You may not be satisfied with the result. And if you don't want to work at our company after that, the way that conversation goes, that's your right. But don't you have no right to go and trash this business online as an employee just because you didn't like the decision. You couldn't run any business on that basis ever. And so it's about the people who run these big corporations basically pandering uh, to a small minority of their employees or more likely to their perceived reaction on Twitter, which doesn't even matter that much. It doesn't really matter whether Twitter likes your brand or not because Twitter is like 0.1% of the people alive or whatever it is. No one cares. Go and sell your widgets. You know. Now, for, for media institutions, of course, 
it's different because they now source their material from Twitter. They source their stories from Twitter. They look at how Twitter responds. And this is this kind of incestuous echo chamber in which they all uh, now exist. And all of us to some extent, I suppose. It's not just them. And that's probably why it was such a such a difficult story for them. But yeah, I think a lot of the answer to all this nonsense is some, some courage and some balls from the people who run uh, these corporations and saying, actually, no, you as a lowly employee of our company do not get to decide the policy of this giant corporation. It's not rocket science. Yeah, now that you mention it, I was thinking back on female comedians I've enjoyed, and they often riff on male sexuality and stupidity and how bad lovers males can be and on and on and on and it's actually pretty funny because half of it's pretty true of course right? it is. <laughs> you know, well, of the course. oversexed well, man you're talking about the human condition and you know the fact that i mean i'm going to be very controversial here michael and say that it is a you know scientifically observed fact that women have a wider emotional range than men and therefore may be perceived as being less stable perhaps sometimes and men are more sort of like oh, they can't have any emotions and what you know as as a as a i can't remember whose joke it is but uh uh, you know, men uh, more mo- earn more money, have fewer feelings. That's about it. Like, that's the difference. You know, the, to observe this is not exactly going beyond the realms of, you know, credulity or, or acceptability. These are pretty stable, uh, st- staple items on the, on the comedy diet throughout history. Can you make it funny? Can you make it clever? That's the basic thing. I'm not offended by jokes about men, not generally offended by jokes about women. Uh, they are perceived differently by the public, by the way. You can't make the same jokes about men as you can about women. And as a comedian, you learn the skill of doing that. That's that's part of the process. And my Forget point is, just because you told one bad joke, that, should, that shouldn't end your career. Yeah. Might have been a Seinfeld joke. Uh, women need a reason to have sex. Men need a place. And, yeah. you know, the, it's <laughs> kind of funny because it's kind of true. I had David Buss on the podcast about his book called mm. uh, Men Behaving Badly. And it's a, it's a, mm. it's the different, it's kind of male, female differences in sexuality, dating behavior, and so on. And he has massive data sets from these dating sites. So, you know, with millions of data points, like, for example, um, you know, what percentage of the um, profiles that you examine and, and think about, would I want to date this person or not? And for the men, it was like, I don't know, 96.4% are acceptable. I would go out with it. For the women, it was, you know, the opposite. It was like four and a half percent. You know, so basically, if you're a guy, you stand next to no chance of getting swiped right or left or which, whichever one is the, it's the good one, right? And then another one he had that was kind of funny, actually, was, you know, how many dates would you have to go on before you'd be intimate with this person? And, and for the women, it was an average of seven. And for the men, it, the average was less than one. So there's a lot of guys that just say, why bother going on a date? <laughs> you let's, know, get, let's just do let's it now, down. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, it's almost yeah. like the differences between men and women, Michael, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> right, which is what comedians like you traffic in. I mean, so why not yeah. make jokes about that difference, right? That should be okay. I think so. And look, it depends. You know, sometimes there are comedians who make jokes that I don't like about women and some uh, female comedians who make jokes I don't like about men. Uh, do I, I remember I was standing in the green room one time a few years ago and there was a female comic. It was actually a good comic, uh, but she was she was doing a bit about how she's thinking of having an abortion because her baby is going to be a straight white male. Now, <laughs> okay. I didn't oh, think boy. that was particularly funny. Neither did the audience, but... It was a new material opportunity for her to try some material. She tried it. She didn't get a laugh. She probably never tell that joke again. Um, like nobody died. Do you know what I mean? It's a joke. It's just a joke. People should be allowed to try things out, even if I don't like them. Like that. that, that that's kind of a basic rule that I have. Just because I don't like something doesn't mean you shouldn't be allowed to have it. Yeah. Okay, and we're coming up on my own heart out here, so let's hit two final topics. Capitalism, uh, isn't it unfair? I'll just give you the tee it up for you. Uh, so few people have so much money, you know, what What some tiny percent, point on one percent, have, you know, 90% of the wealth in, in the West and so on. Income inequality, you know, the Gini index, on and on and on. It's just so unfair. 
That's the result of capitalism. It is unfair and it is the result of capitalism. Uh, what's your better alternative to that? So, well, something like socialism, maybe a Bernie style, you know, redistribution of the wealth through progressive taxes. Uh, well, we have a similar version of that in, in most Anglosphere countries. Uh, the, the America is unique in that the United States has a, a very sort of win or lose attitude to things. It's a product of your history. It's a product of the, the immigrant nation that you guys are. Uh, it, I think it works for you guys. You know, every system has its trade-offs. Uh, for me, a little bit more redistribution is good. Uh, I also think um, we have to address uh, areas of corruption which emerge in a capitalist system. Uh, one of them is, for example, in the UK, we have a gigantic housing crisis, which means that uh, house prices rise so much faster than people's incomes that young people are essentially locked out of the opportunity to have their own space. And that means they start families late, and, and if, if at all. And then it means that they're, you know, they're busy dyeing their hair pink and protesting about you know, trans rights or whatever instead of getting on with life. And I always say to conservatives, like, how are you expecting these people to be conservative if they have nothing to conserve? You've got to address the situation. So there are pockets of genuine blockage that will arise in a market system. And, and that's where you have to come in and regulate or you have to adjust it. I've got no problem with that. I'm not an absolutist about the free market. Uh, but I do think the free market is essential. And that will, uh, you know, the free market, generally speaking, uh, not always, and there are exceptions to this, but it rewards, uh, it reflects inequalities in society. Uh, you have more money than me because you've created more value for other people than I have. Uh, and if I create more value for other people than you have, then I'll have more money than you. Now, there are exceptions to this. There are some forms of unpaid work, for example, that, uh, that are not rewarded in our society, and maybe they ought to be, uh, or maybe we uh, just have to, you know, there are different ways of managing. It's a complicated question how you reward work that's currently unpaid. Uh, but that work isn't rewarded in, in socialist systems either. So every society is going to have its trade-offs. Um, and it's, as, as I said to you uh, in, uh, in our conversation about immigration, it's up to the people of the country. If they don't like the system that we currently have, they should vote for somebody else. Now, so far, they haven't. Hmm. Right. So clearly okay, they are somewhat satisfied the with what we've got, right? I think so. For the most part, most people are reasonably satisfied, yeah. So your final chapter is 10 ways to destroy the West. I don't want you to have to go through all 10. Just pick a couple there. In the context of, you know, here we are, um, August 17th, Liz Cheney just lost her primary yesterday. So she's out for telling the truth and, and being devoted to the Constitution and the rule of law. You know, in other words, Trump has kind of divided the GOP uh, between the cult of personality that he is and and the kind of old school conservatives and then you have on the other side biden and then you know kind of the far left woke progressives who are kind of dividing the the democrats and you have someone like andrew yang who wants to start a new party a forward party let's you know do something different like european countries have like six half a dozen viable parties uh, you know i don't see that happening here people are talking about you know if the election is not in 2024 not perceived to be legitimate on either side you know we could have civil war and so on so what are you worried about for the West in the coming, let's say, decade? I am not worried so much about the West's internal struggles. I believe we have the tools to overcome them. Uh, I, as my very good friend Bridget Fetisio always says, America is too fat to have hmm. a civil war, um, which I think is a great <laughs> yeah. line. Uh, and I don't mean it, in line. any offense to 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 my my beloved Americans, uh, but I. I, I, I'm not sure that I worry so much about that. I believe genuinely, Michael, that we in the West have nothing to fear about except except our own obsessiveness with all this irrelevant stuff that is distracting us from the things that matter. And if we can realize the nature of the threats that we're facing uh, and come together around those issues and stop this divisiveness, we have absolutely nothing to fear. And I hope that the people who run... Uh, I you know, I, I really, I, I'm 100% certain Donald Trump will run if he can. I really wish he didn't. I wish he'd, he'd set, you know, step aside for someone like 
DeSantis, who's less divisive, but has many of the same policies, because actually on policy, I thought a lot of what Donald Trump was was talking about was quite sensible policy wise. It was his behavior that bothered me. Um, so if the Republicans were to have somebody like that, and if maybe the Democrats could elect somebody who's got a pulse, we'd be making some progress, I feel. Nicely said. Perfectly done. I loved your book. Constantine, here it is again, An Immigrant's Love Letter to the West. It's a nice mirror on who we are to see it through the eyes of somebody who's an immigrant. So thanks for doing that. Thanks for coming on the show. And thanks for your comedy work and your podcast. I love all your stuff that you're doing. Michael, thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me on. Uh, what's next <laughs> is uh, we are going to build more and more of trigonometry. We've just come back from a big trip to the U.S., uh, as you know, mm. we had Bill Burr, mm -hmm. Sam Harris, Adam Carolla on the show. We were on Joe Rogan's show. We, we've got a bunch of other people we'd, we'd love to interview. So I think part of the future of our show is we're going to spend a bit more time in the United States, get you know, hang out with people like you and others that we admire and like over there. Uh, and, uh, you know, to make sure to add as much of that as we can. Because while I think this remote stuff is brilliant, and I certainly am grateful for the opportunity that technology has given us, there's nothing quite like sitting down with somebody face to face no, and having no. a real uh, conversation. So uh, that will be a big part of our future. That sounds good. All right. Thanks a lot.